All right, everyone, welcome to the Genesee Village Plan Unit presentation. Thank you so much for being here. We're excited to do this presentation for you. My name is Dory Dalton. I am a firefighter and your wildland specialist for the Genesee Fire Protection District. I've been a member of this community for the last 10 years. This evening, you're gonna hear from Brian Mallett. He's the open space manager for the Genesee Foundation and also a forester. You'll also hear from Becky Smith, Nancy Bolter and Chris Garlasco from the Genesee Fire and Safety Committee and the foundation. They've helped me put together several of these presentations and they'll be helping me out this evening. This presentation will be recorded and posted for later viewing on the Genesee Fire Rescue website and I will share it with the management company. Uh, we've set aside an hour and a half for this presentation. You'll be muted during the presentation, but please put any questions in the chat box as they come up for you. The chat box will be monitored and we'll have a, um, a Q&A at the end of this presentation. All right, so what is a CWPP? So our community wildfire protection plan was updated from the 2008 report. It's an 18 month project that's complete, that was completed in April of 2021 in partnership with the Forest Stewards Guild. You can find a complete copy of the CWPP on the Genesee Fire Rescue website. The CWPP is a tool for Genesee Fire Rescue land managers, residents, and HOAs to help prioritize projects to make the district safer and more prepared for wildfire emergencies. Please remember it was a snapshot in time. The project includes data that was collected by driving all the roads and a general on the ground assessment of risk factors. We modeled the potential wildfire behavior under 60th, 90th, and 97th percentile fire weather conditions. And these are conditions that occurred in our district about 40%, 10%, and 3% of the days between June and October. That's the period we most often associated with the fire season and the data was collected from 2009 to 2019. And the weather parameters came from the data collected at the Lookout Mountain Remote Automatic Weather Station. And as we talk about red flag warnings, please understand that that means fire weather conditions are present. They're gonna include warm temperatures, very low humidity and stronger winds and are expected to combine to produce an increased fire risk danger. The higher the percentage, the higher the fire danger. The 97th percentile fire weather conditions modeled in the CWPP would qualify for a red flag warning and are similar to the conditions that occurred during the Elephant Butte fire in July of 2020 to the southwest of our district. Genesee Fire Protection District experienced five red flag warnings in 2019, 16 red flag warnings in 2020, and during the last fire season in 2021, there were three red flag warning days in November and four in December. And during those red flag warning days, during that time, there were multiple wildfires, including the most destructive wildfire in our history on December 30th. The conditions used for the 90th percentile fire weather scenarios would constitute a red flag warning day only if widespread thunderstorms were predicted for the area with a possibility of lightning strikes. Conditions used for the 60th percentile weather scenarios have higher fuel moistures and lower wind speeds. All right. So as you look at this slide, your plan unit is up here. It's just south of I-70, it's this light pink, and you can see the um, addresses included, the roads, okay? All right, so these plan units were created along HOA boundaries and property boundaries with considerations of roadways and topographical features in mind. So there are three ways that um, wildfire threatens our homes. And the first way that I'm gonna speak with you about is the radiant heat. And that's when the energy is, the radiant heat is the energy that's transferred through the air to other objects when materials burn. If a house receives enough radiant heat for a sufficient time, it will ignite without flames contacting it. Sometimes radiant heat can break the glass and windows allowing windblown embers to enter the house. Even if radiant heat radiant exposure isn't long enough, large enough or long enough to result in ignition, it can preheat surfaces, making them more vulnerable to ignition from exposure to flames and embers. Even vegetation and other fuels located away from the house can pose a threat. And then on the right side of the screen, you can see windblown embers. Uh, embers are the most common cause of home ignition. 
They're light enough to be blown through the air and can result in the rapid spread of a wildfire by spotting. And that's when embers are blown ahead of the main fire and they start other fires. And then the last way is on the bottom right. And this is direct flame contact. And that's when fire reaches your home through the tree crowns or along the surface of the ground directly to your home. All right. So this slide identifies um, your overall hazard rating for your plan unit. And I need everyone to understand the entire Genesee Fire Protection District is 95% more likely to have a wildfire as compared to the rest of the US. This puts us at an extreme hazard rating. The ratings of the different plan units are relative to one another and they're based on four variables. And the first variable I'm gonna share with you is fire risk and you're this yellow outline right here, okay? Um, and when we talk about fire risk, this is gonna be based on fire behavior, which includes wind, temperatures, and low humidity, uh, the topography of the area you're located in, your location, and the fuel in your plan unit. And you have a low hazard rating for fire risk. And then we look at suppression challenges, and that's gonna be, again, you're right here, this dark black outline, and the suppression challenges again, based on fire behavior and challenges that can arise while we're trying to get equipment into the area to fight fire. So that's why it's gonna be important to have clear, you have to clear the roadside vegetation and our optimal driveway and roadside clearance is 13 and a half feet high by 20 feet wide. And these are based on Jefferson County recommendations and Genesee fire apparatus size. And again, you can see that you are a moderate hazard rating. Um, the next, um, Reading I'm going to talk to you about is your evacuation hazard. Again, based on fire behavior, the location of your plan unit, the visibility during the fire, and the width of the road. The type of evacuation notice, is it the entire community evacuating or just part? Are you residents exiting while we're trying to get resources into the area and there's two-way traffic? Are you on a non-survivable road? All right. And you can look, um, again, your area here is at a low risk. And then the last risk I'm gonna to talk to you about is on this bottom right, and this is your home ignition zone hazard. And those things are gonna include things like your roof, your siding, and your defensible space. And your defensible space is gonna be that 100 foot circle around your home or 150 feet, it gets bumped out if you're on a slope. So defensible space is the buffer you create between your home and the grass, trees, shrubs, and any wildland area that surrounds it. This space is needed to slow or stop the spread of wildfire, and it helps protect your home from catching fire, either from embers, direct flame contact, or radiant heat. Proper defensible space also provides firefighters a safe area to work in to defend your home. We, the firefighters, have, have to have space around your house to make a stand to prevent fire from reaching your house. Think about your house. Would we, the firefighters, be able to defend your house without putting our lives at risk? We would like to see fire on the ground in mitigated areas where we can have a chance to stop the fire and not allow fire to go from tree to tree or house to house um, because vegetation is too close or dense and has ladder fuels underneath them. We cannot fight fires in trees. With all those things um, being said, your um, rating is an extreme rating for your home ignition zones. Um, when you combine all of those variables, your overall rating is considered a low rating, all right? So in the CWPP, they have bullet points, and these are some of the things that they um, noticed or recognized for your um, plan unit. It says the residences are densely situated, flammable siding, and many have wooden decks. Many homes have vegetation growing under decks and adjacent to homes. Higher moisture level is evident um, by the presence of cottonwood and aspen in your area. Firefighter access is most, mostly adequate except in narrow parking areas and along narrow private drives and driveways without turnarounds. Almost all homes are at extreme risk of exposure to short and long range spotting. About 50% of the unit is at risk of passive or crown fire activity. And these things are, are, were modeled under the 90th percentile fire weather um, conditions. All right. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about um, flame length and crown fire. Both of these things were modeled under the 90th percentile um, fire weather um, conditions. And you can see here, here's your outline, this blue area right here. 
Um, within that, it's mostly the light peach color, okay, which lets us know that the fire will most likely be able to be controlled with a hand line under these conditions that were modeled. Uh, equipment may need to be brought in if flame lengths become greater than four feet. And then when we look over at the crown fire activity, again, you're outlined in this blue. And within your plan unit, you can see you've got a mix of the yellow and the orange and the really light yellow. So that means the, under these conditions modeled, um, there's opportunity for surface fire and passive crown fire, which means fire is spreading to due to surface fuels, which is modeled right here. Those would be things like bushes, grasses, or other small trees under the canopy. Um, and then when we talk about the passive crown fire, um, the, there are usually patches or stands of trees that um, torch or ignite due to the ladder fuels that comes along the ground and the ladder fuels allow the fire to move up into the trees. All right. So again, Genesee Fire Rescue will fight the fire until fire behavior makes it unsafe to do so. All right. So the um, community on the left, this is Waldo Canyon, and this is a community that was destroyed by embers. You can see there are standing houses. You can see trees that are literally where they were around the homes. They're scorched, but they're not totally destroyed. So these houses, again, were destroyed by embers. All right. Um, this is a photo of a superior neighborhood that was destroyed, and it was destroyed due to embers and radiant heat. Okay, so here's a property from the Cold Springs fire. This property um, did have mitigation work done. They had an assessment done um, and they focused on the area where um, in their um, zone two, which is five to 30 feet out from their home. And they broke up the continuity of fuel around their property so that there wasn't a direct um, line of trees to their home and to their buildings. All right, so there are step, steps we can take as homeowners to help lower our risk, and in many cases, our neighbors' risks as well. And I'm gonna share a few of those with you. All right, so we're gonna talk about canopy spacing and minimizing flame length. Um, all the things I'm gonna share with you are based on Colorado State Forestry Service guidelines, uh, NFPA, and science. So first of all, we're gonna talk about um, spacing between crowns. And when we talk about tree crowns, we're talking about the most outer reaching parts of the trees, we're not talking about the tops. Um, and it's recommended that there's 10 feet between crowns. And if you have trees on a slope, they should be even further apart. When we talk about limbing trees, the trees should be limbed six to 10 feet from the ground or a third the total height of the tree, whichever's less. And when we talk about limbing, we talk about again, out this most outer part. So if you were trimming a six feet, a six foot person should be able to walk underneath this tree. All right, something else that would be really helpful would be to remove those ladder fuels so that fire can't go up into the trees. Um, a lot of our trees, we have these dead limbs down here and we have things growing underneath the trees. We need to re remove the lat, whoops, sorry. <laughs> we need to remove the ladder fuels. Um, when vegetation's on fire, uh, the flame is usually two to three times the height of the vegetation. So these need to be removed and this tree needs to be limbed. Okay, so nothing is underneath the tree and it's limbed up. Something else you could do would be to mow your zone two, which would be five to 30, five feet out from your home and it goes out 30 feet. You can see the continuity of the fuels are broken up, right? This is our area that's lean, mean, and green. Um, and it's recommended to mow to four inches. All right, so um, now I'm gonna talk to you about your home exposure risk, okay? Um, and the risk is um, due to overlapping home ignition zones, uh, potential exposure to short and long range spotting from embers, and then your potential exposure to radiant heat. And first I'm gonna show you up at the top graphic, this is 90th percentile um, fire weather conditions, okay? And then under these conditions, three fourths of the homes are at moderate risk to the exposures that I talked about earlier. And then we move down to the 97th percentile and it goes up to one third of the homes are at moderate risk and one third or at high exposure risk under the 97th percentile fire weather conditions. All right, so these are just a few things that you can do 
to help um, make some good defensible space. You can create that five foot perimeter around your home with no vegetation. That means no grass, no plants, it's rocks, it's dirt, it's a walkway, all right? Um, regularly removing those pine needles from your roof and gutters, removing flammable materials from beneath your deck, on your deck, put your cushions away when you're not using them or you're not at home or you go on vacation, anything flammable. Um, please remember 80 to 90% of homes do ignite due to embers rather than radiant heat. Uh, if you choose to replace the things on your home, your um, materials, consider fire resistant materials for your home. Um, and then, you know, people, a lot of people want to start with trees, but starting with your home is the most important thing. Um, create that zero to five space. All right. So embers don't have anything to ignite. So these are some pictures from around the area that were taken down in Genesee Village. Um, and so this entire slide has to do with decks, okay? So we have some stored wood under the decks. Um, there's other things stored under the decks. Uh, we have grasses going right up to the edge of the decks. Uh, we have lattice, okay? Lattice acts like a wick. You know, the fire comes along the ground, right? And it goes to the lattice and then it follows the lattice up to your joists. Um, your supports and it ignites your deck, which then leads to ignition of your siding, right? Um, this, this is a really good example of ladder fuels. We have this long grass, which goes to these trees. And again, one just lights the other and continues up. And this tree is over the home, which again is gonna touch the siding. Again, the long grass here, the wood. Wood's supposed to be stored 30 feet away from the home and at least 10 feet away from all trees. Um, some places you can store it. I realize um, many of us have smaller footprints. In the garage is a good place that you can store it. Um, and here we have a deck completely surrounded with trees. A lot of fuel continuity. All right. So uh, this slide, again, uh, is just firewood piles. And again, just like I said earlier, they can easily ignite from embers or surface, surface fire, fires. And they emit a significant amount of heat and or direct flame contact, which can ignite your home. So again, firewood piles should be 30 feet from all structures and you should ensure there's at least 10 feet of clearance between the piles and all of the trees. All right. So um, in this picture, we have a lot of openings underneath things. You can see kind of these little areas down here, right? And then this is a door with an overhang Here's another doorway with an overhang. And I know in one of these pictures, there was some furniture, I think it's right here, and it had some cushions, okay? So it's um, so just keep in mind that embers can enter the, under, the unenclosed floor areas, um, like right in here and right in here, okay? And can ignite whatever might be under there, dried pine needles, pine cones. So some of the things you can do is you could use cement board to close off these areas. Um, so that embers cannot collect there. And as far as the overhangs go, just think about what you're putting under there. You know, if you're having your cushions there, take them in when you're not using them. Um, replace those coconut core uh, doormats with heavy rubber mats. Uh, they're not 100% uh, fireproof, but they're definitely gonna be more flame resistant than those coconut core mats. And then take your mats in if you have to evacuate or you're out of town those kinds of things. Just think about the types of things you have hanging on your house, wreaths, wood decor, where embers could collect and essentially ignite your siding. All right, so these top two photos are about vents. And why I, I highlighted these is I just want everyone to know that this is, again, one of the things that we can fix on our homes to keep embers out. Um, the new standards are for vents with screens like this one right here, uh, it's one eighth inch non-corrosive screens, okay? Um, this looks like it might be one eighth, I'm not for sure, but you can see how the edges come up just like they do on all of our homes with age and the, the edges are up here. So it's really important that you, you check the screen size of your vents, you check to see that they're in good order, all right? And these vents over here as well. Um, check your laundry vent. You know, the laundry vent, 
usually collects lint. That's an excellent place for embers to fly, um, ignite the lint and make it the, the way into um, your home. Um, you shouldn't use bird guards on there because again, the lint gets caught in it. Any vent you have, if it has a flap, it should shut completely when it's not in use. If you have any vents that are no longer in use, close them off. So then again, nothing can get into them. And then you can see the bottom three pictures are just different um, varieties. It's mulch. Um, mulch is highly flammable. Um, I, again, would recommend removing the mulch and replacing it with crushed granite or some type of decorative rock, whatever you would be um, allowed to have in your area. Okay, um, so in the top picture here, we have some landscape timbers. Many of our homes have landscape timbers. So the recommendation for landscape timbers are to remove timbers that are within five feet of wood siding and replace with non-combustible non materials such as, as stone or concrete. If you're unable to remove those timbers, then remove the vegetation in front of it at least five feet out from the timbers, again, to, to prevent the surface fires from coming along and touching the timbers and getting lodged inside and making its uh, way up all the way to your siding. Um, so again, I'm not telling you to go out and replace things because I know that's expensive. We had to do that to our home. So you can mitigate around it, all right? Um, and then all of these, uh, well, these three right here, Okay, we have all of these junipers here. All right, so, you know, junipers have lacy evergreen foliage, which burns quickly because of its texture, and it also contains flammable volatile oils. All right, so they're, they are highly flammable. Um, it is a recommendation not to have junipers growing within 30 feet of your home. Okay, and then we have a wood fence here. So keep in mind that wood fences can ignite anywhere. They have contact with flammable materials such as grass and pine needles, and they lead a fire right to your home. And I can tell you that has been a huge issue in some of these big fires, definitely with the collection of things at the bottom and just going right to the home. Um, and so, you know, what you can do is you can replace five feet out with a metal gate or just remove the fence. All right. So um, on this slide, there's just a variety of different things. Um, I just wanted to share again, here's a lot of ladder fuels. You've got all of this grass, a lot of low growing um, limbs that look dead. Um, this tree should be limbed up and underneath of the trees you keep should be um, mowed to four inches. Uh, top photo, again, we have a lot of foliage over you know, this, uh, these decks underneath, you know, that's considered an overhang. Again, those branches under there, it's not the um, trunks that are gonna catch fire, right? It's gonna be the needles. So again, um, we have tree growing over the house. These trees, it's recommended to be 10 feet off the roof and away from your siding, okay? And then same thing here, this continuity of fuel, right? It's gonna follow the surface and it just goes right up to the house, okay? And then right here, this was a good start in the middle of the bottom here of a zero to five. This, you know, I, I don't remember if this is a sidewalk, it might be. Um, so again, this is really great. You know, there's rocks in here, but again, no vegetation. So this person's got a good start. Um, again, in these photos, just lots of fuel, right up next to houses, um, next to driveways, um, these trees are overcrowded. Um, they definitely need to be uh, limbed. And if we need to come and defend your home, there's not a safe place in here for me to stand and, and put fire out. So you really need to take that in consideration. This looks like this might be some of that Russian sage, which a lot of us have growing. But again, it's a ladder fuel to our trees. All right. Um, for those of you that don't know, I do home assessments um, for all of the community members here in the Genesee Foundation uh, in the district. And once I do uh, an assessment, you receive a report with mitigation recommendations and photographs. They're yours. They're just recommendations. You can choose to do them or not. You own the data and, and the report. No one can call me and ask me for your information. Um, it's not even stored here at the station. It's stored off-site. 
I, this is a sort of sort of certificated program. So what that means again is if you go through with all the recommendations, I come back out. Um, I check to see that you've done it and you receive a certificate for three years. That's my contact information. I will be putting um, a link with all of that information into the chat box uh, at the end of our presentation. Uh, an assessment does cost $100 and all up and down the front range, Evergreen, um, Inner Canyon, uh, Elk Creek, they it's the same. We all charge the same for the program. So any money we receive goes back into uh, wildfire education and other mitigation initiatives. All right, so I wanna say thank you and I'm going to hand it over to Brian. Thanks, Dory. Yeah, if I can. Hey everybody, so my name is Brian Mallett. I'm the open space manager for Genesee Foundation. Um, obviously, I don't represent you all, the Genesee Village, but Dory asked uh, for me to share what we do in the Genesee Foundation, as it might be helpful um, for you all to understand some of the some of the risk and some of the mitigation actions that we undertake. Um, and so, before diving into that, I just want to I like to go over a little bit of forest history, some basic. Um, reasoning why we do uh, forest restoration projects. So Genesee Foundation has 1200 acres um, and about between 900 to 1000 of it is forested. So Genesee Foundation has been doing a forest restoration for a long time and that's a big part of my job. So this first slide um, just shows you in Jefferson County an area that what it looked like 100 years ago um, and generally front range forests in Colorado and a lot of the West um, were a lot less dense uh, before uh, a big push for fire suppression. And of course, um, just development as well. So folks move into more forested areas, uh, fires were stopped. Um, and so you can see on the left, it's about 50% less compared to what's on the right. Uh, and so if the naturally occurring fire doesn't occur, then the forest keeps growing. Um, and we get, we get uh, dwarf mistletoe outbreaks, mountain pine beetle outbreaks. Um, we've got a lot of other beetles as well, and a lot of other insects uh, in other parts of the state that affect different trees like uh, spruce budworm, um, Douglas fir beetles. Um, there's pinion ips beetles for pinion trees. So there's lots of things and they're all natural and they all belong there. Um, just like fire, but if we have an overly dense forest, the uh, effects can be exaggerated and then you toss in climate change as well, and it um, exaggerates it even more. Can you go to the next slide, Dory? And so this is an example of a forest treatment in Jefferson County. On the, the top left, you can see before treatment and then on the right, immediately after treatment. So you can see they removed a lot of trees, mostly the ladder fuels and then thinned it out a good bit, um, probably about half roughly. Um, there's not a lot of large trees in this photo, um, but you can see most of it is, a lot of that was removed was small stuff. Um, you know what, that star on the left is not in the right place. I messed up on that, but that tree is in there on the top left one. Um, and then on the bottom, you can see two years after treatment that that star is correct. So it gives you a good reference point. Um, and so generally what I tell folks, uh, and this is for larger forest projects, but what I tell folks is it looks pretty ugly right after the forest uh, project is completed, um, but the grass comes back really quick. And if anybody knows their weeds, you can see mullein in the front of the, in that picture in the bottom one. So weeds do come back into it um, as well. They, they love disturbance. And so weed management is a part of forest management as well. Um, but generally it looks a lot better and it looks a bit more natural. Um, and so at the bottom, I just mentioned that it's reduced to a more natural density and most of it was removed ladder fuels to prevent a crown fire. Um, and generally what we try to do as foresters in Colorado is mimic what a wildfire would do. Uh, that is to say a, a low intensity surface or medium intensity, uh, not so much a crown fire, but a fire that should have occurred maybe 50 years ago before Colorado became more developed. You can go to the next slide, Dory. 
And so this is just a quick snapshot of ignitions, so fires that have happened. Obviously, uh, we haven't had any big fires in the past 18 years here. Um, and this is because we have a great fire department. We have a very dense uh, wildland urban interface. So we have a lot of fire resources and folks like Dory and the people that she works with get on those fires very quickly. Um, there, I wanted to point out that you all probably know this if you've lived here even for just a year, you know that car fires happen on I-70. And that's something I consider, um, I guess when I do forest treatments as well, and like, where is a fire gonna come from? That's something that's, it's hard to say, um, generally maybe from the Southwest because that's the wind where the wind will be coming from, but it's also where where is the fire gonna start? Lightning can strike anywhere, um, but then we also have a potential ignition source on that very crowded highway where we all know trucks, their brakes will burn up and then uh, it'll catch the grass on fire and that does happen. Um, and so all of these pinpoints, they're man-made or natural, I couldn't differentiate, so it could be lightning. More of them are becoming, more likely it's becoming a man-made fire such as like a car fire or cigarette butt or something like that. So I just wanted to point that out that fire still happens uh, around us. We just have very dedicated folks that put it out pretty quickly. You can go to the next one, Dory. I think there's a delay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, there it is. Thanks, Dory. Um, so what do I do on open space? A big priority of ours this year and with the release of our CWPP is mitigating our evacuation route. Um, so what does that mean? It means removing trees along the roads that could prevent timely and safe evacuation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slides. And then each year we try to do between 40 and 50 acres of forest restoration. So similar to those slides that I showed you at the first um, a lot of this is supported by grant funding, and this is often in residents' quote unquote backyard. So, um, kind of similar to the Genesee Village, open space just weaves in between everybody's homes and their backyards and that kind of thing. And so, I do a lot of outreach, a lot of education, and um, a lot of the treatments that we do is very close to a home. And, you know, some folks, um, you know, if they're, if, they, if they are and should be concerned about wildfire, they see it as a positive, but then there's also folks that aren't super excited about it. Um, and I, I do my best to talk to folks about that, but that's just the nature of what I do. The open space is everybody's backyard um, and we need, to, we need to do forest mitigation. And so when I do this education, I talk to folks and I tell them you wanna hope for the best, such as the Elephant Butte fire, which was um, in 2020 in Evergreen, um, that didn't burn any structures, any primary structures. Uh, and there were no um, there were, there were no lives lost, uh, but we have to plan for the worst, such as the Cameron Peak fire, which has now been overshadowed by the Marshall fire because of the extreme destruction that had. Um, and so, planning for the worst means doing forest restoration, wildfire mitigation, defensible space, home hardening, and preparing your evacuation routes. And then the last thing, I, I still get folks saying, if it's gonna burn, why should I do anything? And it, even especially after this Marshall fire where that was extreme and that the winds were extreme too, it was up to hundred mile an hour gusts. So why should I do anything? One for emergency response. So you want your firefighters to be able to get in to your cul-de-sac, to your private drive, to your driveway safely. So that means not having flammable vegetation hanging over your driveway or having four foot grass right along there, um, because if that's on fire that they can't get in to get to your neighbor's house, to your house or the house five, five houses down. Um, second reason for your own evacuation. So those same things that I just mentioned, having all of that so that you can have a more timely and a safer evacuation. And then lastly, you can prevent your home from igniting. It's not a guarantee, obviously, um, but all the things that Dory said um, about defensible space and home hardening can potentially prevent your home from igniting. You can go to the next one, Dory. So I wanted to talk about non-survivable roadways. That's something that our CWPP pointed out. Um, and that's the um, that's why we are at Genesee Foundation concentrating on mitigating our roadways. So 
A non-survivable road, according to the CWPP, is portions of roads adjacent to areas with predicted flame lengths greater than eight feet. Um, and just a quick um, tidbit on that, generally, uh, flame lengths can be two to three times the height of the fuel source itself. So if you have a piece of grass that's two foot, um, if that's on fire, you could expect to see flame lengths that are four to six feet high. And then you can extrapolate that to shrubs like junipers um, and then go up to trees. And so flame lengths greater than eight feet under severe fire weather conditions, Dory went over those. Um, and drivers stopped or trapped on these roadways would have a low chance of surviving radiant heat from fires of this intensity. You can go to the next one, Dory. So where are these non-survivable roadways? On the left, you can see um, that white outline is the Fire Protection District, Genesee Fire Protection District. And you can obviously see in, in Genesee Foundation, you've got a lot more red than you have on the right there. I've highlighted Genesee Village. Um, and I mean, for those that have lived here and driven around Genesee Roads, you, you know why you see all that vegetation. Um, and then there's just a few points that the CWPP model has said that there could be potentially eight foot flame lengths or greater um, just in those bits there. Um, and Doria, will you go to the next one? I think this is where I have photos. So what we're trying to avoid is this worst case scenario. These are images from California wildfires. So the bottom left one is uh, from the Paradise Fire. Um, and so that's what they mean when they say non-survivable roads. Um, where there's vegetation that's flammable on either side. It could, it could be hanging over or it could just be densely packed along your roadside. Um, and the road that they're on there, that's, that's a main road that's about 26 feet wide. Um, same with that um, bottom right one, that's a, an average road. It's, so the, the uniform road width is 25 to 28 feet road. What I've measured out on our roads, it's about 26 feet is the average. And so that bottom right one is about 26 feet. And you can see trees, grass, shrubs on fire and the flame length because the wind is pushing it one direction over the road um, that the flames are going over the road. And you know it would prevent a normal person, maybe not firefighters, uh, but would prevent a normal evacuee from driving through that maybe. Uh, you can go to the next one. And so these are some photos from some of your roads. And um, I just pointed out that, so you, I think you all know that you have a lot of common space and the actual footprint for the structures is very small. It's usually just the structure itself. And so oftentimes the trees, almost all the trees are on the Genesee Village open space or common space. And so this is one of your evacuation routes, Genesee Village Road, the width is about 26 feet wide. And you can see this dense vegetation that um, if it were on fire, could potentially prevent folks from getting in or emergency responders from getting out, or excuse me, getting in, evacuees getting out or emergency responders getting in. Um, and so what I'm doing on Genesee Foundation open space property um, is on that left side where I put that circle, it would be removing probably five of those, what look like kind of larger trees, I'd call them maybe medium sized trees, but they're about 30, 35 foot tall. So removing those and then a lot of the ladder fuels that are underneath them um, just because they prevent, present such a hazard. And then on the right side, we have a lot of nice spruce and fir down there. A lot of it's spruce. And uh, that blue spruce has really tightly packed needles and it always grows right to the ground. Um, and they're just great at catching fire. So fire always starts on the ground. It needs ladder fuels to get up to the treetops and spruce have its own, has its own source of ladder fuel by growing all the way down to the ground. And then also underneath those spruce, you'll, if, if you have any of those, you can go see, you'll, you'll find a lot of dead needles right under there, dead dry needles, even in the winter time, they, they're not exposed to a lot of moisture. And so they're perfect kindling for embers to ignite year round. You can go to the next one, Dory. So here's another, another one. It's not a primary evacuation route. This is one of the um, smaller drives, um, but this is just a good example. Dory talked about this, but we got these beautiful spruce provided probably a lot of good um, blockage from the road. But again, what I just mentioned there, they have their own ladder fuel and so 
pruning them up 10 foot or one third of the height of the tree to prevent ignition. You can go to the next one, Dory. Actually, I think those are fur. I just saw that. Um, so, and this is where Genesee Foundation and Genesee Village meet up on uh, Blue Stem Drive. And uh, it's a different road that once it stops being Genesee Foundation, the road name changes. And I forget what it is. Um, but this is an example of flame lengths that could easily exceed eight feet. Um, and the CWPP didn't call this out. So it's a model. It's not perfect. It's not going to find everything. Um, and these trees, they're, they're small. Uh, they're very low to the ground. They're very tightly back packed. And they're probably only 15 years old, roughly average, maybe 20. Um, but if those catch on fire and the wind's coming across the road there, it's easily going to prevent folks um, from evacuating. Um, and so again, I recommend what I do on open space, Genesee Foundation open space, eliminating a lot of those, like 90% of those small ones, just doing, you know, half of them, it's probably not going to be good enough because you're still going to have tightly packed small trees that can easily catch on fire. And then of course, if the wind's going up the other way, there's homes up that direction uh, with larger trees. And this is a, a ton of ladder fuel for those larger trees. So yeah, um, Dory, I think that's my last one. I'll hand it over to Nancy. Did Nancy make it? She said she was going to be here in 10 minutes. I'm so. here. Oh, yay. All right, Nancy, <laughs> it's all you. Go ahead. So the same things that Brian talked about in terms of um, roadway survivability also apply to your driveway. And, you know, in the event that a fire starts right next to you and you want to be sure that you can get out of your driveway, so you want to do the same spacing of crowns, um, the removal of ladder fuels, um, which in, can include a lot of, of shrubs. Um, and then the other thing while we're talking about driveways is be sure that emergency responders can find your house, that, they, that your number is in a place that is easily uh, that, that's pretty standardized at the end of your driveway, that it is reflective from, and if, if your house could be approached from two directions by emergency vehicles, they should be able to see the number from either side reflectively so that they can see it at night um, high enough so that it's not covered by snow um, and using fire resistant materials, not just wood. Um, I think that the, the fire district is getting, working on getting some standardized material and information out to everybody and um, facilitating getting this done in any way possible. The next slide. I, do you guys I look like Brian was seeing it a lot before I was? Yeah, it's delayed a little bit, Nancy. I don't know why. Okay. It's so weird. Okay. I'm going to click it. So here I go. No, it's still delayed. Huh. Oh. Well, when we get it. Okay. So it's okay. an example of a driveway that, that should the fire, should you be trying to evacuate, but the fire started right there, is there quickly that you might have difficulty getting out. You've got tall grasses under the tree, tree limbs coming down. Dory, I talked about the flame length of, uh, from those grasses could easily involve the trees. The trees are on both sides of the uh, driveway with the crap with the with branches pretty much intermingling so you could be in a situation where ah, I can't get out of my driveway next slide so I and I'm really talking now about emergency response the life safety aspects of uh, an evacuation and this was um, modeling done in and appears in the CWPP 
Um, it assumes that the entire fire protection district is evacuated at one time. Um, and since we're being evacuated, probably Riva Chase, which is not part of our district, is also being evacuated. Um, and it shows fairly significant congestion um, getting to one of, and we really only have two ways to get out of the community, exit 254 or exit 256. We all go north. Um, so the takeaways from this, um, I'm going to talk about three takeaways. One is look at the difference on the left between one car per residential address versus two cars per residential address. Please just take one car. It will help you and it will help everyone else in the district significantly reduce evacuation times. Uh, the second takeaway is be prepared. If you get an evacuate immediately notice, be ready to go. Um, and I'm gonna talk about what that means um, coming up. But first, the other takeaway I wanna point out is that it is conceivable, maybe not likely, but conceivable that the fire could be on the north side of the fire protection district, your side of the fire protection district, and it could block our egress to either 254 or 256 or and 256. And this is a significant concern to the fire district because none of our residents have a way out. And there is currently a lot of work being done on trying to get a southern egress route that goes down to 74. It's not going to happen anytime. You know, it isn't going to be available tomorrow. There's a lot of discussion, negotiation. We have to figure out a way to pay for it. But don't think it doesn't affect you. It could affect you. If you can't get out to the north, you will have to exit to the south. Next slide. So this just summarizes the egress challenges that we have. Um, you're fortunate you don't have that many areas of non-survivable roadway the way that Genesee uh, Foundation does. Um, but it can be a life safety issue if you if there's congestion and you're stopped in that area and the fire is there, it can be a life safety issue. Um, we have long evacuation times and we can only evacuate to the north. Next slide. So we want you to be prepared. First of all, how do you get an evacuation notice? Jefferson County uses a system called Code Red. Code Red automatically enrolls your landline if you have a landline. Um, if your landline is one of those voice over internet protocols, like you're getting it through Comcast, they may not have it. They will not have your cell phones unless you go into code red and the easy way to get to it is your 911.net and register every phone that you want to receive notifications on and every email you want to receive notifications on. Um, if you have a caregiver at your house, uh, uh, somebody watching young children, somebody with elderly, be sure that they also are signed up for Code Red. Um, you identify the kinds of alerts you want and the geographic range that you're interested in. Um, so um, very important, you saw with the Marshall Fire, a lot of people said they never got an evacuation notice because they had never opted in 
to the system that gives you those emergency notifications. Have an emergency, a family emergency plan. Sit down and talk to everybody in your household and family members who don't live with you as well and tell them what the plan is. If I have to evacuate, my plan is to go to so-and-so's house and here's the contact information. If family, some family members are at home, others are not at home, um, you may be able to communicate with your cell phones, but don't rely on that. Cell phone towers can go down in a wildfire. So have a default way in which you'll communicate. Get to so-and-so's house. If I have cell phone, I will have talked to that person. Um, a ways in which you can communicate. Have Talk to your children if you have children in school. If you're in school, here's what's gonna happen. And you probably won't be able to get to the um, uh, school to pick up your kid. Um, one of the things that uh, we're working on is trying to get the public schools and if, uh, private schools as well to think ahead, what's gonna happen if your school gets an evacuation notice? How are you gonna deal with it? How are you gonna communicate with parents? Um, talk to your neighbors about the safety concerns. Um, there are a number of uh, firewood piles that puts your property at risk, it also puts your neighbor's property at risk. So be able to talk about these things. Many houses have trees between them, that's shared defensible space. Talk about how you can agree to mitigate some of, as much of the risk as, as you and your neighbor are comfortable with. Have a contingency plan. If you have a pet at home or you could have a child, a latchkey kid at home, talk to neighbors so that you can say, hey, if we get an evacuation notice between three and five, my daughter's going to be home. She doesn't drive. Can you knock on the door and take her with you? And then also talk about how you're going to communicate. If there's a, a pet in the house, and you guys are all working, um, you want someone to be able to get into your house and take the pet if, or pets, if there is an evacuation notice. Be prepared to leave immediately, especially if it's a red flag day. That's when our fire risk is the, the greatest. Okay, so how do you get prepared? The next slide. So this is a, a pamphlet that was produced by the Evergreen Rotary Group that has started an initiative called Rotary Wildfire Ready. And they have produced, I think, four different pamphlets. You can download them online. Um, probably the best way to do that. This one in particular, I have on top of my go bag because it, and, and so the go bag is the thing that you grab. You don't wanna get evacuate immediately notice and go, oh my God, what should I take? What should I take? What should I take? Um, and, and believe me, you will be panicked. You won't be thinking clearly. You won't necessarily take your cell phone charger, for example. Uh, you won't necessarily remember to take your medications. So um, put things in there. Um, and sometimes like I had to go out and buy an extra pair of pajamas to put in there so that I didn't have to go grab something to put in. I put in enough clothes to last me for a couple of days, medications to last me for a couple of days an extra cell phone charger so I don't need to think about it. Um, so these are the personal kinds of things joke. that you want to take. Um, everybody will be different. Um, have water. 
because you don't know where you're going to end up and what the resources will be there. So have some, some granola bars or something if you need something to eat, um, extra pair of eyeglasses, um, and have this bag packed and ready to go. And on top of it, you can put um, a list of things to add at the last minute. Um, if you have time, um, some things are essential and you don't have a, a duplicate, but have that list so you can just run and get it and put it in, put it in your car and leave. There are a number of people who advise that if you, uh, if it's a red flag day, put that go bag in your car so it's ready to go. Um, how do you get information on what's happening with the fire? Um, right now, the Jefferson County um, Sheriff's Office has not been stellar in their ways of um, sharing information. The sheriff's position is up for election this year. The Rotary Group is, is talking with the candidates, trying to educate them on this. Um, there are other areas, other counties where if you get an evacuation notice, you actually get a map of the perimeter of the fire so that you know exactly where the fire is. We don't necessarily have that going. We hope to improve the communication from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Department. Um, I personally recommend, oh, it's not there. Uh, Okay, next slide, it's on the other slide. I personally recommend at the bottom, mymountaintown.com. Um, it's out of Conifer. The woman who runs it is very well connected in the um, emergency community. Um, and she is responsible in that she puts confirmed information and not just what somebody said. Um, I went there uh, when my daughter saw smoke from the Marshall fire um, because I knew Marlis would have the information and it would be good information. Hopefully it used to be that the sheriff's department, Jeffco Sheriff had a blog that they kept up to date. They didn't use that the, the uh, last time. So this is the same brochure from Rotary Wildfire Ready, and it has really important information. And it actually is what I've put on top of my go bag. It tells me what to wear, nothing synthetic. Synthetic clothing melts in heat and it will burn you. You want cotton materials, jeans, a cotton shirt, preferably not shorts, not short sleeve, um, take a hat, take a bandana or a mask in case it's smoky, have gloves, sturdy shoes, not sandals. You never know if you're going to have to get out of your car and run. So these are things to consider. The other things that this has is if you've gotten a prepare to evacuate but not evacuate, things to do to prepare your house if you have time. We don't want you to uh, run around and do these things for 20 minutes and then leave, especially not given what we know about congestion um, in getting out. So um, these are things that you can do that will help the firefighters that when they get in there to uh, prepare your home. And I don't think I have any more information. I think that's it. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Becky Smith. I'm a member of the Genesee Foundation Fire and Safety Committee. Uh, the reason we're doing these presentations is to make you aware of what the CWPC says are risks for our neighborhood. Um, you know, we live in a high risk area, but we are doing this presentation to show you um, something tailored for your corner of Genesee. And if you're like a lot of the people um, who've listened to these presentations over the last few months, you, you might be feeling overwhelmed. 
There is a lot of information, there's a lot to do, but hopefully we're also giving you resources and ideas of steps you can take that are manageable. Um, like, like Brian and Dory have said, you can do things that will save your, that could save your home, that will lower the risk of um, it going up in, in case of a wildfire. Um, one of the other things that we're encouraging you to do are neighborhood walks. And this is an opportunity um, for you to get to know Dory. So come out and she'll meet with you and um, walk the street with you and answer questions. You know, and, and this is your chance to ask about that tree or this shared space or landscaping ideas. Um, and so we, we are encouraging uh, individuals to do that. Uh, next slide, Dory. We're asking that people step forward and contact Dory. Uh, and she will coordinate with you to set up a date. And if you don't know your neighbors, um, you know, she can help you find a way to, to let them know about the talk that you define your neighborhood. You know, it could be five homes, it can be 30 residents. Um, it's just whatever you feel comfortable with. And it's a, it's a chance to have, not only to meet Dory and talk about your risks and ways to address those risks, but to meet your neighbors and have those conversations that Nancy was just talking about. So there's really a lot of benefit to do this. Um, we've had folks doing this uh, now for a couple of months, we've had walks, and one of the great things that comes out of this is that people start helping each other. Um, you know, I have a picture of this lovely old tree on this slide. You can see, I'm, I'm sure you can recognize the risks here. It's, I mean, it, if you were on a hike, you would say, oh, that tree's been around. It's, it's, um, if, only, if only it could talk. I'm sure it's seen a lot, but we see the ladder fuels. We see the grass going right up to those dead branches, and that. If, if this is near your house, um, this is a risk if you have a tree like it. So this is something that you could do on a weekend. And if you have neighbors who uh, struggle to, to do things like this, and there's you know a dozen reasons why someone can't get around to it, get together in the neighborhood and offer to help. So that's something else that might come out of this neighborhood walk. So there's, again, we're, we're just encouraging folks to sign up with Dory. Um, and, I, and I've also got on here reminding you that she's offering this home assessment. Uh, the neighborhood walk is more of a general discussion. Uh, the neighborhood walk is your house. And she, she will find, I think, everything that, that you could possibly do to um, improve the chances that your home would survive a fire. Um, I've had it done. And <laughs> even after sitting through these presentations, I, uh, there's things that I had missed. Um, and she pointed them out. And so now I've got, you know, I've got some things to do, but I don't have to get it done overnight. So I encourage you to, to sign up for that. The next slide, please. And finally, um, this is some of the agencies we've talked about. These are the websites. Um, Dory is going to put a link in the chat, I think, that will also have these as well as more. There'll be more resources, but this is just a real quick list of some places you can go to learn more. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back to Dory. Thank you, Becky. All right, let's see here. Huh, if I can get the slide to move because there's a lovely delay. All right, so friends, what I'm going to ask, um, that is the last slide. We're going to have um, a Q&A session here in just a minute. But before we do that, I'm going to launch a Zoom poll. And um, in this Zoom poll, it's just asking your opinion about how um, you feel our presentation went. Uh, it's just six questions. It'll just take you a couple of minutes. If your Zoom's not up to date, you might have an issue. We've had some trouble in the past. Um, and I'm gonna have it up for about two or three minutes and then we'll open the floor and we'll try and answer some of those questions you have. So let's see if it'll let me, oh, it'll let me launch. Okay, so you should see it on your screen. I guess I can stop sharing, can't I? That might help, there we go. All right, so somebody give me a thumbs up if you see it. Sweet, thanks Bev, awesome. And if there is something we didn't cover that you want to know about, put it in the chat box and I'll try and get it answered and um, get it sent out to you by the um, property management company. And you just scroll on the side. Thank you, somebody answered a question. Thank you.
We'll get that answered for you, Bev. The chat box is being monitored. About another 30 seconds and I'll check in with everyone. Again, as you've gone through the questions, if there's something we did not address, please let us know in the chat box for future presentations. We've probably done, I don't know, eight to 10 of these. So anyhow, all right. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Unless somebody strongly disagrees with me. <laughs> all right, and let's see, I'll download that. Get back to where you are. All right, Chris, thank you for being here. Chris Garlasco is our moderator and she's going to let us know some of the questions. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Good evening again, I'm Chris Garlasco. I'm with the uh, Genesee Foundation's Fire and Safety Committee. And uh, we've got some great questions okay. up here um, to, to start with. Um, we've got a question, which is really good, is you know, some of these units are, 15 feet or less next to each other. So in terms of defensible space, what, uh, how do we handle that? That's a really good question. And you know, so given your smaller footprints, it's gonna be really important to work together with your neighbors, right? We're only as strong as our weakest link. So coming together and figuring out how you can mitigate together, you can talk about it, have a conversation, um, that is extremely important. It's that zero to five, right? It's making sure that you start there and you talk to your neighbors about starting there. It's gonna to have to be a community effort, but it does make a difference. Great. And another really good one, um, you know, if you're in an area that doesn't have a lot of trees, mm -hmm. we still have issues with grasses. Uh, so what, what should the plan be for uh, grasses and especially grasses on open space versus uh, some of the private areas? Okay, so I did reach out and my understanding is that residents are permitted to mow the natural grasses and other ground vegetation on the common areas surrounding their property up to a maximum distance of 50 feet from the side of their house or deck. Grass must not be cut less than four inches in height. All right, and then I also know that the master board is investigating the cost to have the tall grasses in the common areas mode. Um, they have a proposal right now, but it's pretty expensive and they're still soliciting other proposals. So science shows that if you take care of your 100 feet, right, that's gonna help. So definitely start with your defensible space and you do have the opportunity to take care of it. Um, and Brian in the open space where I live, he doesn't mow all of that grass. We give him a courtesy call. We say, hey, can we do this? And then he lets us know. So it is our responsibility. So, all right, thanks, Chris. And I'll, I'll jump down because I think this is kind of a related uh, question. Okay. You know, this discussion of mitigation on the HOA property again versus your, your private ownerships and mm -hmm. is Genesee Fire working with uh, the condo HOAs? and um, any actions or plans and. Okay, so I'm not really sure the Genesee Fire Rescue, we're not gonna do the mitigation, okay? Um, I'm happy, I, I don't remember who the person is that's the HOA president of the condos. I know that they that person had reached out to me before. Um, I'm happy to come and do an assessment, um, but that person needs to reach out to me because that's considered a multifamily dwelling. And um, unless someone from that board contacts me or every single person in the building is in agreement to get it done, I can't come do an assessment. Um, I'm happy to come and talk to you. Um, and as far as common area trimming and things, you have to get permission of the master board. Okay. 
Um, next up is um, any grant prospects. And this, I guess, is a difference between, you know, grant found grants that the Genesee Foundation up the hill have versus grants for the village. Well, you know, grants are tricky, right? I mean, generally a grant's going to be a 50-50 match. You have to have cash to put up front because generally you get reimbursed. Um, so that's a starting spot, right? Yeah, there are grant opportunities but there needs to be people that step forth to kind of help organize it. It's a big deal. Um, you don't get the money first. You have to put yours in and then you get reimbursed. And when you do a grant, there's definitely different types of grants. And Brian, you know, I'm not, this is not my area of expertise. So please let me know when I make a mistake. You want um, me to, so yes, go Nancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it is, possible to and I think probably the fire protection district is going to um, apply for what's called a fur worm grant through Colorado State Forest Service and the grant can support with a 50 percent match as Dory explained um, fire mitigation that meets Colorado State Forest Service standards um, the Genesee Foundation has successfully applied for one of those grants, but most recently we were unsuccessful when we applied. And the way going forward based on the feedback that we have gotten is that it isn't just one house that wants to do a defensible space plan it is a group of houses so that the work has strategic value over and above a single house here and a single house there. So I think the plan is that the fire, that the fire district will apply for the grant and make it available to all of the HOAs, but we will encourage and probably limit it to groups of houses. Um, the, the total acreage probably isn't, um, uh, that we've talked about for Genesee Foundation probably is not appropriate for uh, Genesee Village, but these are conversations that we will have to tell you what we're looking for for this grant application. You know, and, and also um, Brian and I did bring the, the HOAs together to try and do a large land mitigation grant um, and we were not successful. So that might be something you want to reach out to your HOA boards about and ask what is being set aside for mitigation. It's, it's not a cheap thing. I mean, it just, it just isn't. So, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not sure, you know, what is set aside. That might be a question to ask. And just to sorry. clarify, when I yeah, said sorry. not successful, I meant we applied and didn't get it. When you said not successful, yeah. it was that the HOAs were not willing to come or unable to come up with the matching funds that, you, that they have to commit as part of the grant application. Well, there were a couple of reasons, but yes, that, that definitely was one of them. Brian, did you want to add anything about that? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, also, question from Jerry about will the Genesee uh, Master have any fire hazard removals planned for this summer, especially in that riparian area? Um, the uh, Genesee Village is that is that what you said, Chris? Well, he he said the Genesee Master. So I mean. The board is, there thought, is there a thought that there's some greater entity over than just the village, but um, we, we oh, don't know what shaking the, head. Oh, oh, Genesee Foundation. Okay, so uh, the riparian area, Brian, I don't know where that's at. Is I that, still think that they're talking about Genesee Village. I don't think they're talking about Genesee okay. Foundation. Okay, Bev shaking her head. Yes, that's, she thinks. I am not aware. I don't know. Again, that might be something that you reach out and ask. Oh, water drainage areas. If that's that's not on the foundation 
right? The anything around the pond, Brian, right, is not on foundation. That's yeah, none of that's Genesee yeah. Foundation. Yeah, Genesee Village. Um, I'm not sure. Oh, and Blue Stem. Nancy wants to know about Blue Stem. Um, uh, so I think I think a lot of these are good questions for your board. Uh, Dory doesn't know this. Uh, yeah. She's an advocate for this kind of work. Is what she. That's how she supports you. But it's something that you would all have to discuss with your board. And then um, anything on Genesee Foundation, um, I can, I can, you can email me directly, and I can show you all the maps of what we're planning on doing. As far as Blue Stem, that's in our secondary. Um, we have our primary evacuation route area that we are doing for roadside mitigation this year. And then we have secondary and tertiary. So it's a long, it's gonna take a long time. It's gonna take two to three years. And I think blue stem is in the secondary or tertiary that we have planned out. So maybe not till 2024 around there. Yeah. I would, I, so I did, uh, Dory was referencing a conversation that we had with some of the representatives of the Genesee Village Board. Um, and I offered to partner with them on a grant where I would do work on Genesee Foundation and they would do work on Genesee Village, but for various reasons they weren't interested. And so I can't do it on Genesee Foundation because of access. I would need access to Genesee Village. And you guys, it's up to you to, to talk with your board. They represent you. If, if this is an important thing that you feel that they need to spend money on, you need to let them know that. And I would also um, say that uh, you see a couple of us and we've introduced ourselves, we're members of our fire and safety committee. So we formed a committee, we use that to become informed, get educated. Um, we use it for influence and to get things done. And it's a great model for you to think about putting together your own committee and then, uh, you know, we'd be happy to collaborate. And, but uh, a lot of this is, is how we get it done. For example, pushing the foundation and our community to um, consider hiring uh, another person, an assistant for Brian, because of the, the extent of the work that we foresee. So that was something that we had to educate the community and, and the committee works on all these different things. There's a great question in here um, from Bev about um, how do you get notified about red flag days? Well, so Bev, um, we have something on our website you can go to and look to see if it is a red flag day. It's not gonna be on the front. Um, our website's pretty simple. Um, you can do the news, you can, uh, there are lots of um, websites, the My Mountain Town that Nancy mentioned, definitely you can check the Jefferson County website definitely in those summer months when it's been really hot for quite a while, I would check those things, so. And uh, maybe put on your and website. Most your, weather apps. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and Nancy, maybe mention about that, uh, again, that link for the news for the, the woman that puts the mountain town yep. uh, link together, because that's a great one to keep track of news as uh, issues develop and during issues to kind yeah, of see what's happening. It's my mountain town. My mountain town. Dot com. Dot com. And I think they also have a Twitter feed, but I don't know any. I, I, I don't Twitter. So <laughs> I, I don't know. I imagine she puts the same things um, on that. Yeah, it is. It's a good one. There's yeah, she is definitely and, up to date. And in terms of red flag days, I, I always listen to the weather on the local news and yep. they always say red flag warning for you know this area. So that's another way of, of knowing. Good question. Yeah. Um, interesting uh, comment from Phil talking about following the state of Colorado guidelines, but he thinks they're extreme and they'll destroy the ecology and animal life of the forest. Why not go with the Firewise approach um, that was used to be advocated by Bjorn Dahl? The Firewise approach is updated, and those are the updated standards, even with Firewise. But Brian, I don't know if you can speak to the damaging of the other things. Um, yeah, I guess I would just say the, the results of a catastrophic crown fire is what would be 
what would damage the ecology. Um, so any of those treatments that I mentioned at the top, um, which is forest restoration, um, you're removing a, a lot of the trees, sometimes it's 50%, it's bringing it to a more natural density so that if a crown fire does occur, um, it can drop to the ground or if it doesn't drop to get to the ground, the intensity is still not as severe that it will uh, damage the ground so much that the ground will become hydrophobic. So one example of that is the Hayman fire in 2002. That's in Jefferson County um, down south of Deckers there. You can go down there and you can still see the damage that the fire caused and the trees haven't come back. The grass has, there's a lot of weeds, but there's, it used to be a dense forest and now there's no cover for wildlife whatsoever. Um, so that's that's the opposite, the, the extreme end of the spectrum that we'd be trying to avoid. So that would be the, the ecological reparation part. And I just want to stress that FireWise updates with all of these things too. It doesn't remain remain static. It it changes. And and I think that um, yes, we're looking forward and things are getting updated. But Brian, you've helped us look back in time and see what natural forests look like around here. And that's really more ecologically healthy than what we see now with some of this overgrowth. Am I correct? Yep. So that's why I say it's, it's forest restoration. Um, and that's, uh, it's forest restoration. It's also wildfire mitigation. You're restoring, restoring the forest. And there's other factors as well, like, you know, what's not natural is that we all live here in the forest and so we have to adapt to it. Um, and you might be cutting some trees that are closer to a home that might not fit your exact forest restoration objective, but the higher objective is life safety. And Nancy just put up and said, well, this is a lot of work. What about putting it in phases? What do you think about that? And Brian, that's something that you that can be done, right? We we can focus on a certain amount of acres, right? Can you do that within grants, right? Yep. Yeah, I regularly do that within grants. So the typical grants that I apply for and get are between three and four years in its duration. Um, and so I mentioned in the bullet points that we try to do between 40 and 50 acres of forest restoration a year. Usually the grant we apply for uh, between 50 and 100 acres. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a phased thing. And that also, you know, the cost can be phased as well. Good question, Nancy. Let's see, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into um, the, um, their HOA financials. I think they need to talk about yep. that. But um, uh, Stephanie is asking Dory, yeah. Um, have you been contacted yet to do any of the assess assessments? Down um, I was in a meeting and they said they were interested, but they haven't contacted me since then. And so it definitely would need to be a phone conversation or a meeting. But yeah, I'd be happy to. Can I emphasize to, um, uh, you know, somebody said it's, it's a, a lot of work. Um, and anything you can do is helpful. Dory told you where to concentrate first on that first five feet around your house. You, you all are at risk for ember showers that can easily land on a wood pile, on a cushion, um, on a shrub that's right up against your house take care of that first. If, uh, it, and I think that, that there are homes that still have flammable roofs, cedar shake roofs, for example, that's your biggest vulnerability. Replace your roof. When, and now the Jefferson County up in above, I think 6,500 feet, no, 5,500 feet, Planning and zoning is requiring fire resistant materials. If you replace your deck, it has to be with a fire resistant material. If you replace your siding or your roof, it has to be fire resistant material. If you pull a 
building permit, and this is new in the last couple of months for work outside your house, for example, even if you're replacing your deck with the same square footage, not only will they require that you use fire resistant material, they will also require that you create defensible space. You're only responsible for creating it on your property. Your defensible space may go over and include some of your neighbor's trees. You're not required to do that, but you are required to do the work on your property. All right. Oh, thanks, Bev. Um, so there's three things that I would like to bring up before I go or before we're done. Um, I'm going to be, this is the updated um, home ignition guide. Uh, I have them at the fire station. I'm putting the link in the presentation. This was updated a year ago. It's got, well, not quite a year, really great information, all the things I'm talking about. So the link will be in in the link that I, I put in the chat box and I will do it again. If you stop by the fire station, I will give you one of these if you want one. Um, also, um, I'm sure you noticed that I put signs on your mailboxes. I apologize. Um, if you take one, peel it off for me, I'd appreciate it. I'm gonna go around and get those tomorrow, I promise. And then um, in the chat box, again, I am putting the link um, too many links. That's going to have um, information about the guide, about how to get a hold of me, um, the fire, the uh, website here at GFR, how to get a hold of your management property. Just, just a lot of different things, articles, etc. Um, yeah. So we have a couple more minutes. Any last questions, Chris? Hey, Dory. This is Adam with yes, Four Adam. Seasons. Yes. I've been here for the whole presentation. It's very good. Um, we've definitely met as each board in, independently and then as the master association as well. Um, it is a topic of discussion. The cost is uh, astronomical right now, to be honest with you. It is something that we'd be looking at either doing a special assessment or uh, increasing dues extremely. And I see some of the other board members on here. So a lot of them are in this meeting, um, it is definitely something we're gonna to be touching on probably for years to come. Um, please send me all this information. I'll definitely send it out to the entire community. Uh, hi everybody, I'm your new manager. I just started two weeks ago and uh, hitting the ground running. Um, with all that being said, yes, we, we definitely need feedback from homeowners because I think our first quote, uh, just as an annual fire retardant type of a, uh, go out there and, and clean stuff up is close to $200,000 just for the common area that's not independently owned by each HOA. So that'd be an additional $200,000 to the Master Association to cut down the, the grasses and, and start, not even complete, but start phasing in the fire uh, plans. And so it is something we're working on. I, I didn't want to be silent the whole time, but we are working on it and we need uh, more homeowners to participate to spread the word and know where their funds are going. Also, I want to bring up the first weekend in May is, is the kickoff for doing cleanup mitigation around your home, kind of like spring cleanup outside. Um, also, I want to let you know, and, and more information will be coming out, but July 30th, I will be hosting a slash drop off for the entire district at GFR. All you have to do is load up your slash, bring it to the fire station and drop it off. Okay. And there will be, you know, some parameters and things that go along with it, but please do that. Clean up your area, you know, um, bring it up and let's get rid of it. So um, there's a question about catalytic converters. I'm not an expert on that. So I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm thinking that we're not supposed to park in grass um, with those kind of things. So that definitely might be something you want to bring up. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I really appreciate everyone attending and participating, uh, so much. My contact information is there. You can contact me at the fire station, um, anytime you can leave me a message. Again, this is being recorded. I will get it to Adam. He does, has done a really great job of getting information out for me in these last two weeks. Thank you, Adam, very much. Um, and again, thank everyone for, uh, attending. So I'm going to stop the recording. Okay.